We're going to turn together in our Bibles, please, to um, the book of Luke, Luke's Gospel, and we're going to read a verse from there, and then we're going to look um, at another verse in the psalm. So Luke uh, chapter 4, and again, just to remind that there's a crash for the little children if a child is being um, a little noisy, uh, just, just slip them in. I think they're able to hear and all uh, out uh, in the room at the back here. So please avail of that. Luke chapter 4. And we're just going to read the one verse. Luke chapter 4. And the verse 18. The verse 18. This is the Lord Jesus when he's beginning his ministry. And he's quoting from the book of Isaiah. And this is what he said. Luke chapter 18, or Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. And then if you come over with me, please, to um, the Psalms, we're going to look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37, again, a, a very beautiful uh, Psalm 37. And for the sake of time, we're just going to read one verse. We'll be looking at several verses uh, this morning, so we're not going to be taking a particular passage, but use these by way of reference. Psalm 37. And verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Amen. And we know God will bless the public reading of his word. Let's unite in prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to meet around your Lord throne and around your presence. We thank you for being with God's people. And we pray again in Jesus' name, Lord, that you will put a strong hedge and a wall around about us. We ask, Lord, that you would send your spirit. We welcome and invite the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will, Lord, come upon lives, that you will speak into hearts. We pray that, Lord, people will experience God in their lives this morning. So we look to you, Lord, I cast myself on you and I ask for help to be given from heaven and I ask it in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. I want to speak uh, to you this morning on this uh, verse, uh, really to use it by way of reference in Psalm uh, 37 and verse 4 where the psalmist, among many other things, uh, states a very important truth. And that is, in verse 4, he says, Delight yourself in the Lord. Uh, and then he says the outcome of that will be that the Lord will give you the desires of his heart, of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. One of the things that happens today among people is that obviously we all have desires and you couldn't really exist without having desires. And many people obviously who are not Christians, their desires are very much uh, toward things material because they have not yet entered the kingdom of God. And therefore the things of God are not particularly appealing or attractive to them. People can endure religion and it gives a sense of a false comfort to them, but it doesn't actually uh, bring them into the kingdom. But then, of course, we observe that even when people are Christians, that there can be real problems and real uh, difficulties uh, that can be present in the life of the Christian. And here is where the psalmist qualifies uh, our desires being fulfilled by the Lord. First of all, we have to delight ourselves in the Lord. Delight ourselves 
in the Lord. You see, if you don't delight yourself in the Lord, then the desires of your heart are going to be frustrated. The will of God in your life as a Christian is going to be limited. So I want to, first of all, just before we elaborate, I want to uh, just explain simply, and this morning I'm going to go through several points, and I trust that they will help you, uh, encourage you, or whatever your need is uh, as a believer, uh, that the Lord will speak into your life. You see, uh, the desires spoken of here in the Hebrew language simply means the longings, the longings. And here the Lord promises when we delight ourselves in him, and we'll elaborate on what that actually means in a moment, but when we do that, then the Lord will give us. This is not something we can accomplish or do. This is something God supernaturally must do in us and through us. And it says he will give us the desires, the longings, the requests, the petitions. It speaks of the eager passion, an eager passion built on strong feelings, these strong feelings inside. And the person that I want to draw your attention to this morning is in essentially the prototype Christian. And I want to reference the life of Paul, the apostle, because his references, he wrote, he wrote a considerable amount of the uh, New Testament and the epistles, and Paul's experience of God his desires and hungers for God are all alluded to in those various books. And so what I want to speak or what I want to give as a title this morning is the desires of the Christian. The desires of the Christian. And I think what you will find as we go through this this morning is that we'll maybe come to a point where you will be with me and there may come a point when you won't be with me anymore in what I'm speaking about. And I'll try and explain the reason for that. I believe that if you're here this morning, there must be a desire to follow the Lord. There must be a desire to know the Lord. There's something going on in you. If you're a Christian, it's the Holy Spirit. But again, let me point out that there are huge problems today in the church. And we're all frequently saying that, but one of the biggest problems is that we are personally not taking time to examine are there problems in our own lives. And first of all, we're not very often willing to do that. And secondly, there are many fine Christians and they are sincere and they really, truly want to follow the Lord. But they don't know how. They don't know how. And they have done everything that the local church has encouraged them to do, only to find that it's not working. And so I want to as simply and concisely to address those issues and hopefully in a way that will encourage you to focus on perhaps areas where in your life you say, Alan, that's not working with me. Perhaps today, by the Holy Spirit, that God will speak into that area of your life and enable you to go forward and to fulfill all the desires that a Christian should have when they're spiritually healthy. We have to enter into the Christian life, obviously, by the uh, teaching of the Bible. It's called regeneration, wherein the life of God enters into the soul of man. Whenever a person is born again, when they are saved or converted, then the Word of God uh, comes alive and they are saved, as we say. They, are, they, they, they receive God's life. And that is when the Holy Spirit enters into the person, not at infant baptism, 
not at confirmation when some priest or bishop or somebody puts their hand on you. No, it's much deeper and profound than that. It is a miracle. It is a miracle of God wrought in the soul of man, and it's called regeneration. And when that happens, we enter into God's kingdom. We begin to see the kingdom of God. That's the domain of God, the king. We start to enter into that kingdom. And the initial entrance for the Christian is, first of all, an awareness or a witness within that they belong to the Lord. There's this inner witness of the Holy Spirit saying, I know now that I'm going to heaven. I know that I have the witness of the Holy Spirit. That's the beginning of the Christian life. Then an appetite appears that wasn't there before. Of course, the appetite is coming not from yourself being more religious or trying to do your best, but simply because there is another person who didn't used to live in you, who, do, who does now live in you. He's called the Holy Spirit, God. And so he creates an appetite. And so we begin to pray. It's maybe faltering. It's maybe, maybe you're not uh, too good at it. Uh, if you're anything like me, you're, you fumble about at the start, and you're afraid to speak pray publicly in case anybody would laugh at you, and you have to overcome the fear of man which brings a snare. But you begin to pray. And then, of course, you begin to read the Word of God because the Word of God is living, and it's a living book, and you find a need for to draw on that book. And this is where the two-way conversation begins as you have entered into the kingdom, and you begin to get to know the king in the kingdom that you have entered in. But you have to remember when you're converted that you've just entered in. You're just a baby, as Peter says. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So I'm a baby in the kingdom. But these are evidences. I have a witness that I belong to the Lord. I desire to pray to him, even though it's not very long. Nevertheless, I can, I can uh, bring things to him and ask him, and then he speaks to me through his word. And again, one of the other evidences that we're in the kingdom is found in Romans 10 and 1, where the apostle says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. One of the great evidences of being a Christian is that you want others to become a Christian as well. This again comes from the Holy Spirit who knows the need of people around you and he plants the desires in you to win others because you are now in his domain and he can use you depending on how willing you are for that. Now, it's at this point, we're already losing some of you. I'm not a prophet, but I'm also long enough in the tooth to know where Christians are, and I know my own heart to a good extent. So I've lost some of you already because you don't have any great desire to win the lost. You don't really do anything. Now, there's a problem there. You don't have particular deep desire for prayer. Uh, the, uh, I believe there's prayer meetings going on in, here in the church. That's wonderful, and I hear that they're good. And yet, uh, I'm, I mean, it's, it's really not my uh, domain to say where people are or aren't. But the point is, um, you see, when the Holy Spirit is filling a Christian, he gives a desire for prayer. <laughs> he does it. And the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of supplication. Now, I know there are people, and it's difficult to get to a prayer meeting. I understand that. But really, what you have to do is, there's many reasons. You know, it's just a variety of reasons. But, but if, if the desire is not there, you have to recognize there's a malady. There's an illness in me. I am spiritually ill. You have to recognize that. If you don't recognize that, you will never truly have the desires of God in you. You see, when you enter the kingdom, the Holy Spirit 
knowing who you would be, knowing your gifts, knowing that you would come into the kingdom. He has a plan, a blueprint for your life, and that blueprint is activated. It comes to a measure of life whenever you're born again. It's the beginning of the Spirit stirring God's eternal plan in you. But that plan can be frustrated. That plan can be averted. And I personally fear that many Christians miss the will of God. That's only a personal thing. I believe that many, many Christians miss the will of God. I don't think they'll ever realize until they get to heaven. Now, I know that there won't be sorrow or sadness in heaven, but I do believe that there will be those for at the period of judgment that the Bema will recognize, I blew it. And uh, we're here to encourage you, and I, we have to encourage ourselves not to do that but to go after God. And so um, we have regeneration where the work of the Spirit uh, commences in the heart and the desire for others to be saved. But then for the individual who is kind of pursuing this route and is aware of these desires within them and they want them to move forward and they're beginning to seek God and use all what the old uh, reformers used called the means of grace, using the means to help you to grow. The, the house of God, the praying, reading, studying, witnessing, and, 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 and putting God first. And so what happens is then once we're regenerated, the conflict comes. Now, the initial conflict, again, is confused by many Christians because the conflict initially is not always the devil. The devil doesn't generally have to get deeply involved in the life of the young Christian, not to the extent that he does for the mature Christian like Paul. Because he has another weapon at his disposal which assists in preventing the Christian discovering God's will, and that is the flesh. We have a flesh, we have a self-life. And Paul alludes to that in Romans 7 and 8. And in that chapter, he talks about the conflict. And it's his early Christian experience, and Paul says, the good things that I want to do, I'm not doing them. And the evil things that I don't want to do, I'm doing them. And in despair, in chapter 7, he says, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? He said, I'm in a dilemma. I, I have the Spirit of God in me. I want to follow the Lord, but I'm frustrated by my own sin. I'm frustrated by my own failure. If you're truly a Christian, you will be able to identify to some degree with that, that I am frustrated and my experience tends to be defeat, defeat, defeat. And again, many fine Christians, because they cannot find any solution, they simply say, well, this is the way it has to be. And this is the way life is. And so therefore, they resolve to a life of immaturity. And a life where the flesh dominates. The Spirit is there, but the Spirit of God is constantly grieved. The blueprint of God for the will of God is there, but it's constantly suppressed. And so the enemy, the devil, doesn't have to do an awful lot directly because your flesh and your sin are doing an adequate enough job in order to keep you from desiring and going after what God wants in your life. So the conflict goes on. Initially, when the convert comes into the kingdom of God, this is generally what happens. There are exceptions, but very few. They enter into the Galatian problem. And every church has a problem like this. And this one's no exception, this church, because they all have it. 
What happens when the young convert comes into the Christian or into the, into the church? They are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. But if there is an emphasis, a deep emphasis on doing things, on keeping rules, on standards, on... Now, I'm not against these things, don't get me wrong, but if there's an emphasis on these things, what happens is that inevitably that Christian will fall into what Paul called legalism. Legalism is a counterfeit to true Christianity, and some wonderful denominations in our country that started out with great intent and great desire, sadly, fell into that. Now, of course, then there's others who fall into a different category because the way of the Christian and the way of walking with God is quite a narrow path. It's called in Isaiah the way of holiness. It's a narrow path. So on one side of this path, we've got legalism. And you sometimes meet Christians, I meet them like this, and they, from a distance, they look the part. They fit in, they, I was going to say they dress, right, because that can be all part of the problem, but we'll not go into the detail of that. But, but they've, they're doing everything, the denomination or the group, and they're doing it with, the, with a good intention and a good heart, and I'm not here to condemn that. But they subtly fall into legalism. It's just about rules. And then, of course, there's other churches, and they say, listen, we've got to get rid of this legalism. We can't have all this. We have been burdened with this. We're broken with it. We can't carry it anymore. The weight of it, it's so oppressive. And so they jump to the other side, and it's called license. So we're saved, but we do whatever we like. We're free, but they're not free. It's just license for the flesh. They say, we're not under the law anymore. We've got to live. And so we do our social drinking. We do our, you know, we're all casual about everything. And so that's the other side. You can swing to one or the other. But then in between the two, there's this little path that God has. And you have the legalism, which is big on one side. You have the license. And then you have liberty right down the middle. Liberty. And liberty, of course, is, is nothing more than the life of the Spirit. It is living in the power and unction of the Holy Ghost, as described in the Word of God by the Apostle Paul. And so this conflict goes on in the life of the Christian, and they subtly can be led into the legalism or into the license. But the problems of the flesh and the problems of sin and self-life are still there. They are still there. One's better at covering it over than the other. But the problem is we're not empowered. We're not empowered. Recently, I have been listening to a lot of testimonies of people around the world who have been involved in what's called New Age, astrology, occult, that type of thing. And one of the things I found fascinating about their testimonies was they had, they, they had come from different types of backgrounds, but they all, they all wanted power in their lives. And they all tapped into demonic power, into the devil's power, and you can do that, and it's very rife today, and a lot of young people do it. And there's many avenues to do it, but it's done. But the interesting thing is that there is power there. There really is power. These people have power. They can do things that are tremendously overwhelming to the mind, the capabilities, because they are entering into the spirit world, that world that is real and largely unseen. They're in that domain, and they are really doing things. And then these people have come to Christ, and I listened to one recently, and she said, you know, whenever I got converted, I realized all the things I had been doing for years was so wrong, and I repented, and I turned away from it, and she said, then, then I came into a particular church. It was in America, I think. She came into a local church, and then she said, suddenly I discovered they had no power. <laughs> I was converted, but they had no power. They had no power. 
And that stuck with me because I thought, how true, how true. You see, the devil can heal. But most Christians believe God can't. <laughs> see, the devil can do the supernatural, and everybody accepts that. But most Christians don't really believe God can do much. That's all stopped with the apostles. That's all gone. And so we have a church that is bereft, bereft of the power that is necessary to reach a dying world. That power that Jesus alluded to, and we look at it in a few moments. You see, dear friends, whenever a Christian comes to that place where in attempting to pray and read and win others for Christ and a deep recognition of inner failure, the Holy Spirit longs that you come to the end of yourself. Now, if you never come to the end of yourself, then you will live in yourself. If you never come to a place where you begin to recognize your greatest opponent and greatest enemy in serving the Lord is yourself. I'm sure there are people here this morning and you're looking around or thinking, boy, he would need to hear that today. She would need to get that today. That'll suit her. And if only he wasn't in the church, what a great church it would be. And if we could get him out, those people, oh boy, they annoy me. Well, that might be. There might be people like that. I don't know. I might be one of those people to you for all I know. But if that's the way you talk, you see, my dear friend, you haven't really got to grips with desiring God in the way the apostle did. Because the apostle cried out, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? How can I get free from this bondage, from this sin in my life, from this worldliness, from this lack of appetite for God? How do I resolve this? And Paul, of course, alludes to it many times, many texts, but I'll just take one. And I want to turn, I've looked at it before, but in Ephesians chapter 3, and Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. These people were soundly converted. They knew the Lord and they loved him. And in Ephesians chapter 3, this is what Paul says in one of his prayers as he's praying for this church in Ephesians or in Ephesus. In chapter 3 and in the verse 17, I believe it is. Chapter 3 and verse 17. And he says here, amongst many prayers, the verse before he said that Christ, he said that you would be strengthened with might by God's Spirit in the inner man. He's praying for these people. You need to be strengthened inside. You need, the, you need your spirit man where the Holy Spirit dwells, that part within you that communes with God, that part that has the witness of the Spirit, that part that desires God inside you, your spirit man. Paul said, I am praying for you that your spirit will be strengthened with might by God's Spirit in the inner man. He said, I'm pleading with you Christians in Ephesians. I'm pleading at the throne of God that this will happen to you, that you'll be strengthened in your spirit man that you'll begin to emerge and you'll begin to float spiritually, that you'll get above sin, that you'll get above self, that you'll get above the world, that you'll learn to get above the devil, that you'll begin to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's what he's pleading for. Now, he's pleading for this from his own experience because he knows what it is to truly desire the Lord. He knows what it is to let the Holy Spirit have his way. And so he cries this in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, when you would initially read that, you would say, oh, that's an interesting little verse. He says, Christ may dwell in your hearts. Well, Christ does dwell in my heart. Does he? Does he? Does Christ dwell in your heart? It depends what the word dwell means. You see, my dear friends, 
if these people, if it was simply to do with God living inside you, these people were all converted. These were all Christians. The Lord dwelt in them, there was no doubt. But Paul's praying that the Lord will dwell in. So what is he talking about? Well, you have to understand the word dwelt that he's praying. You have to get the heart of Paul, what he's saying. You see, my dear friends, he's saying that the Lord Jesus might have a permanent residence inside your spirit. He said that the Lord Jesus might feel at home inside you. That he might be able to dwell in and pervade and prompt and govern every part of your soul. He said, here's what I, I have people come to visit me most days for issues. And so often as Christians, I have to sit down with them with their problem. And this is like a mantra I have to go through with every one of them. I have to do what the church should be doing in order to help them to get freedom. And I tell them that when you come into my house, I said, bring you in, or if a, a visitor came, front room, you know the cups, the wee sandwiches, all that caper, and all the wee niceties, and you all do it, the women are brilliant at it, and whatever, lovely to have, you know, and then the person comes in, and then they go out, and that's the way, the rule of the game. But if that visitor that come in and had your lovely cups and your wee, your wee uh, food and all, if they just said, I'm going to the toilet here and walked upstairs and started pulling through your wardrobe, you'd be saying, hold on, I mean, they've stepped out of line here. Like, you can't do that. Like, I mean, you can come in and we'll give you the cup and we'll give you the best and we'll treat you right, but hey, you've no right to go up to my upstairs. You can't start pulling through the wardrobe. Can't start moving the furniture around upstairs in the bedroom. And dear friends, that's what we have done with God in our lives. That's what we have done with Jesus. We have brought him in. We're so grateful he's come in. And we've put him into the good room. And we've made him the cup of tea. And we've brought out the best. And we honor him with our tongue and whatever. But Jesus doesn't want to be treated like that. What Paul's saying is he wants freedom into every room, every wardrobe. He wants freedom into every cupboard. He wants into every dimension of your life. He wants to go in and investigate. He wants to go in and cleanse rooms where there's darkness. There's rooms in your life where there's darkness. There's areas of your life where hell still rules and you have never let him into that place. And that's what Paul's praying. Paul is praying that the Lord Jesus would have total control of every room in your life. Paul understands if the Holy Spirit is to have freedom in the life, then the life must be open. And dear friends, I am amazed sometimes when I meet Christians. And they're not immature Christians, but they seem to come to a spot. And they stick there. They stick there. I find in my own life, and I'm no Apostle Paul, far from it. But I find in my life that I begin to keep asking the Lord, Lord, would you examine me? Lord, is there a room in my life? Is there a secret cupboard, Lord? Is there wee places, Lord, that need dealt with? Would you come, Lord, and deal with them? My dear friends, when you get that incorporated into your Christian life, you'll find that the Lord will draw near to you. You'll find that the Holy Spirit will gently speak to you. And if you obey him, he'll keep coming to you. And he'll keep coming to you more and more. And he'll begin to reveal Jesus to you. You see, the Holy Spirit's the one that makes Jesus real. The legalism, that can't happen. It's just rules, regulations, just, you know, pretty brutal stuff. But my friend, this root is the root of liberty. It's the root of the Spirit. Very quickly, whenever that happens, the Spirit, we invite the Spirit in to take control. And the Holy Spirit will. When we invite him in, when we let go, when we open our lives and simply invite the Holy Spirit, Please come and take control of me. 
Take my personality. Take my gifts. Take my money. Lord, maybe there's organizations I'm in. I need to be out of them. Lord, Lord, please take me out of them. My dear friend, are you willing to let him be Lord? Are you willing to let him get into every area of your lives? But, but, but some are not. Some are not for a variety of reasons. Some it's the love of money. You bow at the altar, my dear friends, of the love of money. And my dear friends, not only is the love of money, Jesus called it uh, mammon. I, I, I have been amazed over the years with praying with Christians. And some Christians have come to my home. And, and when I prayed with them, they had demonic influences on their lives. And I remember one man in particular. And do you know, do you know what was controlling that man's life? A spirit of mammon. He had an inordinate love of money. And it was a demon over his life as a Christian. My dear friends, you cannot live for the world and live for Jesus. Oh yes, you can, you can, you can dress the part, you can, you can, all that can be done. But my friends, that's not real. You see, true Christianity is real. It is a knowing God. It is knowing God personally. I know him. And so we let the Spirit come in. And as he comes in and he takes possession of the vessel, so we begin to learn to walk in the Spirit, the Bible says. We begin to pray in the Spirit. We begin, my friends, to be filled and be being filled with the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit comes into our lives. We begin to become like Jesus because the Holy Spirit is now filling us. He's filling us with the desires of God. And we find the supernatural and enabling from God because we now enjoy the filling or the fruit of the Spirit. And then, of course, what happens? The more you pursue God and the more you're open to God and the more you abandon to God and the more you put your life on the altar to God and let him search you, then what happens as you pursue him, the Holy Spirit more and more activates. He begins to activate the blueprint in your life. And you know what happens? The gifts of the Spirit, they begin to emerge in you. Everybody has at least one gift. But the gifts begin to emerge. But you see, my dear friend, if you do not pursue him, if you do not go after him, if you do not know the fullness of the Spirit, then, then, then the gifts are all thwarted in you, many of them. Those supernatural gifts that could be such a blessing to you and to those around you, those gifts are lost. They are suppressed. Because God is a God of the supernatural. What happens whenever a person is filled with the Spirit? Well, of course, the Lord Jesus, you remember, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. And what happened? Then the devil came. <laughs> my dear friends, whenever you begin to enter into the fullness of the Spirit, then cometh the devil. Then cometh the devil. Yes. Then he shows his hand. You see, the first way the devil works with the church is he puts his hand on the pram and he just rocks it. That's what he does. He just rocks it. Go to sleep. Just sleep. But if there is a Christian in the pram and they say, I will not sleep. I will not sleep. I will pursue God. I feel the Spirit of God in me. I feel a desire after God. And they can cry like that great missionary of the past. Though no one join me, still I will follow. And that is the way it is. If you're waiting for those around you, my dear friends, to carry you forward into the fullness of God, forget about it. It is a personal thing. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, I press on. I press on. It is personal, but it is powerful because the Spirit is now filling the life. This is what Paul talked about. This is standard, basic Christianity I'm talking about this morning. What we have adopted in this country is substandard, gutted gospel. It is gutted of its power. It is gutted of the cross of Christ, of the need to die to self and to deal with sin in our lives. 
Then cometh the devil. Oh, my dear friends, I, I was in a prayer meeting on Friday night in my home. And initially, the people were there. They were good. good. They all wanted to pray. And they came along, and we were praying. And, and it was just a little bit heavy, <laughs> tough at the beginning. Now, these people are all enjoying in their lives encounters with the Holy Spirit. They all know what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they pray, the Lord is there. It's a really wonderful thing. When the Lord is present, you really don't want to miss it when the Lord is there. And so we were praying, but it was a little bit tough. And then there was this lady in the prayer meeting. And she had sat quiet, but I could see that the Lord was just working in her as she sat there. I was looking across. And suddenly, I could see that the Lord just came upon that woman. The Holy Spirit just came upon her. And she got up and she began to pray. And she began to take authority over the powers of darkness that were bringing this dullness and this deadness, this spiritual heaviness over the prayer meeting. And she did what, 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 what uh, James said. She submitted herself to God and resisted the devil. And friends, he did flee. He did flee. But all this is so foreign, my friends, to us today. You know how I know this is all foreign to us? Because there's no appetite for prayer. And you see, if there's no appetite for prayer, that means the Spirit's grieved. And if the Spirit's grieved and there's no appetite for prayer, that means the devil doesn't have to do an awful lot because he's simply keeping the pram rocking. But thank God there are people, there are those who say, no, I'm not in that camp. And come what may, I'll follow the Lord. Come what may, I'll, I'll go after him. And so, my friends, the Spirit leads us to conflict with the demonic. Now, this is very real. And when it's real, when you experience the fullness of the Spirit, when you encounter that world and you really encounter it, you know what happens? It kind of alarms you to the fact of the reality of what you say you believe. It alerts you to the fact that this thing's actually real, that this is actually true. No matter how far-fetched it seems to us, it's real. And you know what happens? The Holy Spirit uses those encounters to stir us more, to say there's more. Go after God now. There's more. This is what happened Paul. He had encounters with God. And the more encounters brought him up the mountain. He got up the mountain. He looked. He saw the view. He breathed in heaven's air. And he said, I'm so glad God has brought me from that dark valley down in there. But look, there's another mountain. And by God's grace, I'm going to get that mountain too. And like Joshua and Caleb, the Bible said they had another spirit. And my dear friend, if you want to follow God and if you want to do the will of God and you want to get the well done of God, you need to forget about the ten around you that are saying we're not able, it's difficult, God doesn't do that anymore. I'm interested in fighting and gadding and throwing and going on and in and out. I'm with Caleb and Joshua. We're well able to take that land, to pull those giants down and see the victory and get the land. But here's where a problem arises very quickly, and I know my time's gone. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 1, it says that we're to lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us. I used to wonder what that meant, but I believe more and more today in the work that I do, I know what the weights are. The weights are different from sin. And here's what I find. People come to me all the time, Christians from every denomination, every denomination, because we're all the same, we've all the same problems. And they come along and they say, I'm trying, I really do love the Lord, I really am desiring to follow him, but Alan, I have repented for my sin, I repent all the time, I, I, I read, I, I do it all, but there's something. I just can't, I can't get there. There's just something not right. And there's another thing that they say, and it always is an evidence of the weight. And that is, they say, Alan, 
God is not real to me. I know the doctrines, I know the verses, but God as a person is not real. I don't understand it when people say about God speaking to you. I don't understand it when they say about God's presence coming in. I don't understand that. It's a foreign language to me. That's an indicator of a weight in that person's life. Now, let's move very quickly for times against me. It simply means the weight means a bulk or a mass or a burden or an encumbrance, an oppressive load. So are you saying that if you repent of all your sin, you can still have an oppressive load? Absolutely. That's what Paul said. Lay aside every weight. So that's where we turn as we draw toward the close. What did, what did Jesus say? Listen to it now. In chapter, chapter 4 of Luke 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Holy Spirit resting on Jesus. What has is, what is he anointed him to do? This is what Jesus is to do. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Isn't that good? The good news. The good news. Coming into the kingdom, Nicodemus, you must be born again, the woman at the well, and so on. To preach the gospel, praise the Lord. Is that the end of it? Mm, well, Northern Ireland, more or less. Yes, that's the end of it. That's where Jesus stopped. That's right. Come to preach the gospel to us. Hold on a wee moment. That's not what the Bible says. Hold on. Don't be cutting out the things that Jesus came to do. Don't cut that out. You see, he came to preach, and he has sent me to heal, what? The brokenhearted. The brokenhearted. See, my dear friends, you can be born again and repent for your sin and still have a broken heart. You have a broken heart. What else? Preach deliverance to captives. <laughs> Hail captive. Deliverance. <laughs> Recovering of sight to the blind. Oh, well, everybody says, oh, well, that just means Jesus. My dear friends, Jesus, when he was on earth, let's just be honest about it. He healed the sick. Just be honest about it. He healed the sick. That's what he came to do. And that's what he expects to happen in his kingdom, if it's his kingdom. Forget about your theology. Just take the Bible as it is. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. Listen very quickly. You can have repented for all your sin, but you can have a broken heart. That broken heart can come through pain in your life, in your past. It can come through trauma. It can come through abuse that happened when you were a child. It can come through rape. It can come through sexual abuse. It's amazing the number of people who are Christians who have been abused one way or another by a parent, by somebody in authority in their life. And they are desperately trying to follow the Lord. And they know there's a weight there. And how you can generally tell is, first of all, you have a real difficulty in knowing the presence of God. That can be one indicator. Secondly, there are strong emotions still in you regarding things that have happened. Also, there is recurring thoughts that keep coming up in your mind regarding something that happened. That very often is not the devil trying to bring the past up, but very frequently it's the Holy Spirit trying to alert you to the fact there's a problem of pain and hurt in your life that needs to be addressed, otherwise you'll keep carrying the weight. And then, of course, very often with Christians, and I've been amazed at this, I have to say, people from free Presbyterian background, people from independent Methodist, people from... And sometimes you say to them, do you have a recurring dream? Yes. What's your recurring dream? And they go right back to an event that happened in their life, and this dream keeps coming. They say, I just, just push it away. My dear friends, God speaks through dreams. Not all of them, but he speaks through dreams. And God very often uses these methods to draw our attention to the fact that there's a problem. He keeps bringing it up. But because we are not spiritually alert enough to understand that God speaks through dreams, therefore we automatically say, if anything from the past is coming up, it's under the blood. You don't touch it. Leave it alone. But my friend, you could be broken. You could be shattered. And you'll carry that weight with you. It will impede you in your spiritual life. Times against me. I remember a lady coming to see me years ago. 
And I was amazed at this lady because she had terrible abuse. Her family, her father had abused her physically, sexually, so on. Terrible. But she'd become a Christian when she was a child. And so she began to tell me all her problems. Well, I thought when I said, well, when I pray with you, there's going to be a lot happening here. I just know what's going to happen here. And so, because of past experience. And when I went to pray, nothing happened. What I was anticipating, none of it happened. I prayed again. I, I went down different angles that I, I prayed. And nothing happened. I said, you are a mystery. I cannot understand. And all these things happened to you when you were a child. I said, yes. I was just saying, Lord, what is going on? I can't read this woman. I can't read this situation at all. Lord, what is happening here? And then I asked her, tell me, what about your siblings? What about your brothers and sisters? Oh, she says they're all drug addicts or they're all alcoholics. Some of them are dead. I said, and you're the only Oh, she says, yeah, I'm the only one. But I said, you're so together. You I mean, you look so good and you're, you're, you're holding a job down. You're, 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 not, you're, not, you're not a mess. No, no, she says, I'm not. And I says, well, I, I can't understand that. I can't understand how that you're so good, seeing that your family, I, I, what I would expect of you is what's happened, your family. That's what I anticipate, considering the brokenness. And I said, tell me this. Whenever you were hurt as a little girl and your father abused you, what did you do? What did you do with that? You see, what we all do is generally we just bury it and we put it inside and it becomes a toxin inside us and it leads to more pain down inside which manifests as we get older. But you know what she told me? I could have cried when she told me. She said, when I was a wee girl and I was abused, I ran up to the bedroom. I already was a Christian. And I got in under the blankets and I told Jesus all about it. And Jesus healed her, you see. Every time she was hurt, Jesus healed her. Every time she was hurt, she went to Jesus. He kept healing her. My dear friends, bring your hurts to Jesus. Bring your hurts to Jesus. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Let's conclude. Jesus comes to look, remove the weights from us. The weights. And I'm sure there are people here today and you're carrying a lot of weights. I'm sure. But Paul said, and I haven't alluded to them all, but he said that Christ might be magnified in my body, whether by my life or my death. That's my desire. To magnify Jesus. That Jesus would be, would be big. That I would make him big. And haven't we met Christians like that on the journey? Oh, I can think of Christians that I've met, and they made Jesus big. They made Jesus big. And whenever I met them, I come away feeling the good of having been with them because they talked about Jesus, they loved Jesus, and they worshipped Jesus, and you just sensed that they knew Jesus. They exalted him. They magn That's what Paul said, I want to do. And then finally, finally, he said, I <clears throat> have a desire to be with Christ. <laughs> that was Paul's desire. Amazing the number of people says, oh, it's wonderful to, you know, when we all get to heaven. But if somebody said, you don't find a lot of Christians really that keen about going. <laughs> I had an old grandfather, he was a Christian, but I, I didn't know him. But he, I remember hearing in the home a statement that he used to say, if people put as much preparation into leaving this world as they did into staying, how different they would be. Can I ask you, in the light of the desires of the Christian, how many much desire have you to leave this world and how much desire have you to really anchor down and stay? I had a dear friend called Hugh Logan. He had a ministry in prayer. He used to sing, do open airs. He was a wonderful Christian, Carrick Fergus. Went to be with the Lord a couple of years ago. And I got to know Hugh through many prayer meetings. And he was one of the most wonderful men to listen to in prayer. Boy, when he prayed, he brought God down, I can tell you, into the prayer meeting. And Hugh loved Christ. Boy, he loved him. And when he prayed, he was always exalting and glory. I mean, God was so real to the man. God was so real to him. He just loved the Lord. 
But he took an aneurysm. He knew it was going to happen. He took an aneurysm, you know, a clot or, a, or, a, or a, one, of the, one of the blood vessels burst. And he was brought to hospital. He knew he was going to die. And I was talking to his pastor. And he lived for about a day knowing he was going to die. And I said to the pastor, well, how was you? He says, Alan, it was unbelievable. He was like a child going on an excursion. He was that excited, that excited about meeting the Lord. That excited. He says, I'd never been at a, he says, I didn't know what to do. I didn't need to comfort him. He said, he comforted me. He was just like a child going on an excursion. <laughs> Paul says, I have a desire to be with Christ. <laughs> Robert Murray McShane, the great Scots Worthy, the young man who died 29, burned out for God, left a legacy of revival in Scotland. His name is honored to this day, even though he died in 1843. Robert Murray McShane took consumption. His congregation met and wept and prayed, hundreds of them praying for their young pastor that God would spare him. They had never seen a pastor like, there was never a man that loved them like he did. And they pleaded with God. The two Bonner brothers were walking up. They were in the ministry and they were walking up to McShane's house to see him. But the consumption took over. And at 29 years of age, he died. And as the blinds were coming down, the two Bonner brothers turned to one another and one said, McShane's away him. He's away home. And the other said, I, and he didn't have far to go. McShane lived in heaven. He lived in heaven. That is the desire of the true Christian. I encourage you, dear friends, have the desires of the Christian. Have the desires of the Christian. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious and living word. And we pray now in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit will take the word of God and just bury it deep in hearts and give individuals a renewed desire to seek and love and follow Christ. O oh, loving Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Have mercy on us, Lord, we need you. How we need you, our land needs you. So come to us, your people, and have mercy on us first, Lord. And oh, move in our hearts, move in my heart. And God, have your way, in Jesus' name. Amen.